Bucks, class of 91, here for her 20th. Um, I love her description of her, uh, her mission, and that's uh, communicating to individuals in print and in speech uh, the promise that God in Jesus Christ is with them and for them. That's a marvelous mission statement. And uh, she's written some books with incredibly good titles and uh, wonderful, wonderful content. Uh, let me re re read a couple. The, the award-winning The Girl in the Orange Dress, uh, Searching for a Father Who Does Not Fail. Uh, Unsqueezed, Springing Free from Skinny Jeans, Nose Jobs, Highlights, and Stilettos. <laughs> and the forthcoming, A Small Things with Great Love, Adventures in Loving Your Neighbor. Uh, Margo is a, really a distinguished alum, uh, lives on the, uh, well, the East Coast in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, we are so blessed to have you here, Margo. We've been talking about this for a long time. It finally came together. So we welcome you to Westmont as an alum. And as our featured chapel speaker, we're eager to hear what God has given you to say. Let's welcome her. Thank you, Ben. Testing, test, yeah. That whole um, last alumni thing, standing thing, I feel like I have something to live for now. 2051, I'm going to be standing. <laughs> It is a pleasure to be here with y'all today. Thank you. I was born to a single mother who was unable to care for me. I was adopted at the age of three weeks. <clears throat> I was born in Boston. My family moved to the Chicago suburbs. Mother, father, brother. And from the curb, it looked like we were the perfect family. On the inside of our home, though, there was domestic violence, alcoholism. My parents divorced when I was six. My dad moved to Connecticut for a better job. My mom remarried another alcoholic. The next year, my dad remarried, and by the time I was 15, both of those marriages had ended. So what I learned about trust people is that they went away. And what I learned about myself was that I really wasn't worth showing up for, sticking around for, I wasn't worth loving. Everybody deals with loss differently, and the way that I did it was with a great big smile. Anybody who knew me as a student can probably attest to that. Um, I fooled others and I fooled myself. I built this shell around my heart to keep from getting hurt again. And the funny thing is about this little girl-sized armor is that for a while it works, right? It sort of protected me through childhood, but as I began to move into adulthood, that armor around my heart began to pinch and chafe and fail. One of my first um, weeks at Westmont in Page Hall, I met a friend and she had seen a sign on campus for a meeting called Adult Children of Alcoholics. And she was kind of toying with whether or not to go and I, I really felt like she should go. So I said, here's the thing. <laughs> I am going to go with you as a support friend. That's what I said. I'm going to go with you, right, to just kind of get her in the door at the Student Health Center. So I go, you know, and, and every week I sort of listen supportively and sort of nods supportively. Everybody, like, ah, they spill their guts, they cry, they were a mess, these people. And um, at the end of the semester, like, all eyes turned to me. Why haven't you said anything, Margo? Because I don't have a problem. <laughs> and, and I told them, you know, my dad lived in our home. I was so young, I don't really remember. And then my stepdad, like, it's not like he was my real dad, so that hardly counts. And now I live in Page Hall. <laughs> See, no problems. And, um, that was like lying before the parole board, <laughs> and it bought me a sentence in individual therapy. <laughs> I went one time and sort of, you know, kind of unpacked the story, and the therapeutic professional asked me if I felt rejected. Seriously, where do they even come up with this stuff, right? Rejected? No, weren't you listening? I was chosen. I was chosen. That shell still very much intact around my heart. When I came to Westmont, I saw peers who were living differently because they knew Jesus Christ. Uh, my freshman year, I was invited to be a part of um, a homeless ministry downtown at the Salvation Army, getting to know homeless folks. 
My sophomore year, I won on my first potter's clay. Before my junior year, I had a chance to go to South Africa on a Ministry of Reconciliation. And my senior year, I spent one semester in Camden, New Jersey with an urban ministry there. By the time I graduated from Westmont, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loved the world. I knew that God cared for the poor, the hungry, the marginalized, the oppressed. There was no question in my mind whether or not God cared about this, I wasn't as sure. And this series of relationships sort of did a number on my heart. As a senior, I lived with my friends um, on Milpas down near the County Bowl, and um, second semester of my senior year learned that um, my roommate, my friend who was single, was pregnant. And I would say that was the first crack in that armor around my heart, right? Whether or not she would keep her child, give her child up for adoption, she was the first crack. And of course, nine months later, holding this precious little boy in my arms, like 500 more cracks in my shell, I would just look at that sweet little face, and he was kind of just like a, like a bundle of molecules. I'm like, where did he, where did he even come from? <laughs> and... I had taken health class in seventh grade, so I sort of knew where he had come from. <clears throat> um, but of course, right, his arrival opens up this deep wondering in my heart about my own beginnings. Within a few months of his birth, a friend had handed me uh, this Dear Abby article that um, listed the address of a reunion registry, kind of where lost people could find each other. I didn't know even the name of the hospital where I'd been born, but I sent in my information and within a few months had been connected with my birth mother. So I get off of work Saturday morning. Um, the, the moment has been arranged for her to call. I talk to her on the phone. And my birth mother, who still lives in Boston, is delighted to know me. She did, and still does, think that I hang the moon, um, right? Everybody needs someone like that in their life. She was thrilled to know me, and that first phone call she told me about my birth father. He was an artist. They had met when he was an artist at the beach in Cape Cod for the summer, and I had just graduated from Westmont as an art major. Uh, he was an athlete, and I was an athlete. His grandfather was a pastor, his aunts were missionaries, his family had been involved in the Billy Graham crusade, and I was just on my way to seminary. And although I had been conceived, born, adopted in Massachusetts, my birth father was from Wheaton, Illinois, where I had grown up. So right, we, we played sports in the same high school gym, breathed the same air, and of course I wanted to know him. I do my Nancy Drew detective work, and it turns out that he is not interested in knowing me. And there was just enough shell left around my heart. If you can picture like a Tootsie Pop with like, uh, you know, pieces broken up, and there's just a little bit of shell left, that was my heart. It was enough. The final blow, the one I never saw coming that somebody should have warned me about, was marriage. <laughs> Right? Why didn't somebody warn me that everything I had learned as a child in my deepest places about a trust person would become weirdly transferred onto my unsuspecting husband? So what that looks like a few months into marriage is um, I put dinner on the table. I think he's going to be home any second. Five minutes go by, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, he's not there. My husband comes home to find me just in a pile on the dining room floor, sobbing, unable to speak, can't move my arms, can't move my legs, feeling abandoned and rejected like an infant. I was completely undone, and I knew that God needed to heal my heart. I gave God lots of suggestions about how that should happen. <laughs> Most of them involved me like getting hit by lightning and being better and then like testifying in my Presbyterian church that God heals people. <laughs> that was my plan. Um, God's plan went differently than that. It was a process longer than I wanted, more expensive than I wanted, more unwieldy, more painful than I would have chosen. I had friends who sat beside me on a couch while I wept. 
I had um, a really good Christian therapist. Um, I got medication that my body needed. I had friends who would take me to their prayer groups and sort of give me to like the super prayer <laughs> in the group to fix me. Um, <laughs> I went to healing prayer conferences, and um, right, so I try, I'm living in New Jersey, I travel back to the homeland, I'm in Wheaton College in the space where they have their chapel, and, and I'm undone, I'm just like, somebody take me to the airport, I just want to go home, and you know, they, they deal with messy people all the time. They had this woman pray with me, and she says, let's ask God to give us a picture of your heart, and I said, ah. I'm Presbyterian, so I don't necessarily, you know, get the divine satellite signals. Um, but I, I humor her. I go along with it. Okay, fine, what, whatevs. Let's just pray. And, and she says, right, she gets the signal first. And she says, oh, you know, what I'm seeing is sort of a, like a moon-like surface with cracks and craters and crevices. And, and I did see something. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm, what I'm getting is like the Tootsie Pop, right, with the shell and the pieces. And... Although it's not the sort of spiritual glamour shot that a girl hopes for, <laughs> it was exactly what God was doing in my heart. When I was in the pit, though, <clears throat> I would read scripture, and it didn't sound right. For God so loves the world, okay, right, I'll go along with things, God loves the world, that he gave his only son. Wait a minute, God gives his son, like, People give their kid up for adoption or lose their kid to foster care or move across the country for a stupid job. God gives up his son. No, thank you, right? If that's what God's love was like, I did not need it. We had moved to North Carolina and a friend came to visit me and she had kind of tracked along on this journey with me. She asked me how I was doing and I said, you know what? Finished, just about finished. And it didn't mean that I was finished healed. It didn't mean that I was finished living. It meant that when I added up the time, money, energy that I had poured into this, it seemed inordinate, right? Because I knew that God had plans to heal and to save the world. I didn't know about this. I created this weird sort of triage where once God kind of got poverty, just, injustice, famine sort of cleared up, <laughs> then... God could take care of this. And I said to her, doesn't God have better things to do? And I can still see her face because she said, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> right? She knew something that I did not. And that's that God's great love for a world in need can never be separated from God's deep concern for the hearts of individuals. Those two things can never be pulled apart. I had just enough sort of psychological information to be dangerous. And I had read this um, German psychologist named Alice Miller, and her work was with adults who in childhood had experienced abuse or neglect. And so when these folks grow up, she saw this, this one group that would repeat that cycle of abuse and neglect. That would be more typical. But then this other group who, who stopped that cycle of violence, who grew up to survive and to thrive, she found had one thing in common. And to a T, what every one of those individuals had was a person in their life, she calls it a helping witness, who reflected for them the truth of what they are worth. So it could be a, a, you know, a pastor, a teacher, a neighbor, somebody whose face tells the truth, says, you deserve better than this. You are worth loving. Those were the ones who grew up to survive and thrive. And so I was mad at God. I said, where was that face? Where was that one face that was for me when I most needed it? And somehow, sort of out of heaven, two words sort of drift down and land in my heart. I am. I am. And, you know, right, it's, it sounded familiar. Gosh, where did I hear that? Oh, the Bible. <laughs> right, so that wasn't God. That was just my subconscious, you know, remembering. The Bible, you know, besides Jesus with I am this, I am that, um, when God gave Moses this sort of unwieldy assignment, <laughs> Moses is like, yeah, um, if I'm going to tell my friends and neighbors that that is the plan, they are going to want to know who sent me. So, um, you know, some form of ID. Do you have a business card? Are you on Facebook? Because <laughs> they're going to want to know. And the name that God gives to Moses is I 
am. Right, so that can't be God, because I read that someplace. <clears throat> Two more words, I am for you. And immediately I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like license card, you know, inspirational bracelet, where have I seen I am for you? And as I'm still resisting, in my mind, I see a picture of Jesus on the cross, and I get it. For the first time, I get it. I had so many caregivers who loved me and told me they loved me, but they were not able to be for me in the way that I needed them to be. And so here was one who didn't preserve his own life at my expense, but rather gave his life out of his love for me. All these fancy words I had learned at Princeton Seminary about the Trinity, suddenly I got it in my bones. This isn't the father who cavalierly sacrifices his son. This is the father who gives his own life out of love for me and for you. Friends, I am so convinced that this is God's big business, that the Holy Spirit whispers to every heart, I am for you. And when we get that in our deepest places, we are set free to be for others in Jesus' name. A friend of mine named Alejandro grew up in El Salvador in a very poor <clears throat> um, community that was gripped by poverty. And when Alejandro was about the age that he started going to school, he was matched with a sponsor, probably from the U.S., and that sponsorship allowed Alejandro to begin attending programs in his local church where his social, emotional, physical, spiritual needs were met. And it turns out that that church is the place where Alejandro was introduced to Christ. When Alejandro was about 12 years old, a woman in his church had a vision. And in this vision, she sees Alejandro all grown up, um, and he's wearing a business suit. Now, <clears throat> I have to be honest, that's not my idea of a good time. But, um, but I could see, right, how for somebody raised in poverty, that would be sort of a vision of hope and a future. So I go along with it. Um, when Alejandro's parents heard about this vision, they laughed. They laughed not because they did not love their son, but because also caught in the web of poverty, they couldn't imagine anything for their son other than what uh, they had experienced and what their family had known for generations. So of course Alejandro sort of, you know, puts this, this out of his mind. Uh, Alejandro does well in school. He becomes a leader at his church, especially among the young people. And uh, I think you guys will remember something like this. But as a senior, he, um, he applies for a program through Compassion International that will allow him to go to college. So I think you remember, right? There's the applications, interviews, and then Alejandro waits and he prays. One day, Alejandro sees his pastor coming down the road to his home to tell him that he has been accepted into this program. And when Alejandro tells it, <clears throat> with tears in his eyes, he says, that's when I knew that God had not forgotten me. That's when I knew that God had not forgotten me. That's when he understood in his deep places that God was for him. He had had these parents that loved him. He had this sponsor who was that face, right, who reflected for him that he was worth loving. He had these folks in his congregation, his pastor, all poured into Alejandro. But there was that moment, right, when he understood in his bones that God was for him. Friends, this is what God is doing in the world today. And if Alejandro was like a one in a million sort of case, I would be honest, I would tell you that. But around the globe, children are being freed from poverty in Jesus' name through the Ministry of Compassion International. I want you to think of one person who has been that face in your life that reflected for you the truth about your value and your worth. Last night I got to have dinner with... Um, 
a woman who worked in the art center. When I was here, I worked a little bit in the art center. And um, she was one of those people. And there was also a secretary who worked in the English department who in my life reflected for me how much I was worth. So I want you to think of one person in your life who has been that face for you, the face that tells you the truth. And I want you to think about sponsoring a child through compassion today <clears throat> because you have the opportunity to be that face in the life of a child, to reflect for them their worth, right? To be kind of God's presence to them with skin and bones. And I know um, some of you have probably thought about doing something like this for a while. I know that was my story. I would see like the kid's picture on people's refrigerator and I would think, oh, they are such good people. I am not that good person who could have a kid on my refrigerator, right? So it took a while, but finally I had the opportunity and kind of got the kick in the pan. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've thought about this for a while, haven't done it, or maybe you haven't considered doing something like this before, but the spirit is giving you a little nudge. Um, it is really easy today. Um, we've got tables out in the back, and we're also going to be in the D.C. at lunch. Um, please come see us. If you can sponsor with a credit card today, we want to say thank you and give you an awesome T-shirt. Um, <clears throat> And here's the thing, I know, especially students, that there is this voice in your head that says, okay, like, yeah, I have $38 this month, but I don't know if I'm going to have it next month. Or, you know, I know in a few months I'm going to be raising money to go on a mission trip in the summer. That is not God's voice. <laughs> and all I can say is that if this has your name on it, God will provide for you. Um, <clears throat> big idea of the day, a two-sentence blurb in your church bulletin. I know you guys are active in your churches. I am sponsoring a child through compassion. I will babysit for you one Friday a month, $38. Stay out as late as you want. Um, people, I'm a parent, and that's a win right there. <laughs> um, yeah, you can do this, and you were made to do this. Today, um, we have this great opportunity. When I was in El Salvador, I met a woman named Rocio Carmichael, who was orchestrating programs there. And somebody introduces her to me and says, Rocio went to Westmont. I'm like, yeah, of course she did. So was I delighted? Yes. Was I surprised? No. This is what we do, people. We change the world. Uh, I'm just saying, we do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a little boy named Mauricio um, who is waiting for a sponsor. And uh, I do hope that you will meet us in the back after chapel and do this thing. Sponsorship changes children's lives. <clears throat> and just one snapshot before we go of what that looks like. Um, I had the opportunity to see some compassion programs in action. And you, when, when you visit a child's home, they, you know, they get all excited. They, what they do is they run and they get their letters from their sponsor, right? Like that is their prized possession. They bring the letters, bam. One visitor receives this packet of letters like fabulous, a stack of papers. They go through it and every single page is blank. And so what is that about? And a translator explained there had been a flood that had passed through this village and had erased every drop of ink on that page. But that child could tell you every word on every page because what they had learned from their sponsor was that their life mattered to a sponsor and mattered to God. Um, this is a win, people. Uh, this morning, I got a little message from Rocio, and I would love to be able to message her back and let her know uh, that we are sponsoring kids from El Salvador. There's also kids from other parts of the world. Uh, that Westmont is for Rocio, as Rocio is for Alejandro, as Alejandro is for the children in his village. This is the plan. Uh, and I'm excited that you have the opportunity to be a part of it. If Ben doesn't give a super long benediction, we're going to get out of here a few minutes early, people, and um, want to give you time uh, to fill out some forms and find a child today. 
Some of y'all know in your bones, in your marrow, that you are God's beloved, that your life is precious and that you matter. And others of you are more like me. My prayer for you is that you will listen to the constant whisper of the Holy Spirit in your ear saying, I am for you. Let's pray.